I recommend if you really want to do it right, you really should look at accommodations in the uh, in a sleeper car, right. which gives you options. The, the one I have usually gotten is the roomette, which is a small room with two seats that face each other. And at night, uh, that, that gives you lots of room. Yeah, at night, the, the two bottom seats fall down to, to give you the bottom berth. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Simmerman and that is Mike Christensen with the Utah Rail Passengers Association and a frequent user of Amtrak. And uh, I wanted to talk with Mike about the possibility of taking the Active Towns tour out on the rails uh, via Amtrak. And so uh, he's gonna walk me through some tips and some things to do and, and just how feasible it is for me to take that Active Towns tour out on the rails. So let's get right to it with Mike. Mike Christensen, such a wonderful uh, pleasure having you back on the podcast. Welcome. Thanks. <laughs> it's great to be here. So you were on the podcast a long time ago. I mean, we're, we're talking, this was way back in season one. <laughs> and uh, it was so, so much fun catching up with you uh, back then. And we, we talked a little bit about uh, your new project that you were working on. And you were, we, you were really sharing your vision for what it was going to take to try to revitalize rail connectivity in Utah. And, uh, and, and just for context, this is like four years ago. This was in early in the pandemic, in July of the pandemic. And so uh, we've got some, even got some photos down here. That, oh, yeah, there's the photo with the, the mask on. So that dates it for you. But uh, we'll talk a little bit about the context and the history and where you're at these days uh, with your efforts. But uh, why don't we do this? Why don't you just take a moment to uh, like a, a real short introduction, like 30 seconds. Who is Mike Christensen? Well, uh, I am a transit and active transportation nerd. A lot of that comes about from uh, having the opportunity to have lived in Germany not once but twice. Both experiences, I was very much immersed in, in public transit, and uh, that really influenced my, my views on really understanding that our, our idea of the, the very st stereotypical American dream of living in a single family home and driving a car everywhere might not be the most, you know, the best, highest and best way to live. So that uh, is me in a nutshell. Yeah. And uh, you and I had talked about this uh, the first time you were on back in, in 2020 about the fact that, uh, well, A, we know each other from seeing you. And we're going to talk about your organization that you have founded. Talk, talk with us about Utah Rail Passengers Association and what inspired you to, to found this organization. I also, let's see, about the same time that I went back to grad school and was getting involved in, in CNU and Strong Towns, I also got involved in the National Rail Passengers Association, which is a Washington, D.C.-based advocacy organization that has really been doing a lot of great work. In fact, we, we played a big role in the uh, passenger rail, especially the inner city passenger rail portion of the bipartisan infrastructure law. And I got involved starting in 2014 in, in leadership of Rail Passengers Association and was elected to the board of directors in 2019 and have been on the board of directors ever since. And so I, when, when I, after I finished my master's degree in 2018 and was looking at the next step, I decided to create the Utah Rail Passengers Association and basically kind of patterned the organization after the national organization. And I realized that there was a lack of of institutional capacity in Utah, or in other words, like a leadership void. Basically, it wasn't 
anyone's job at any level of, of government in Utah to look at things like statewide transit and passenger rail that connects the entire state. We have the Utah Transit Authority and a handful of other transit agencies around the state that do a good job with local transit, but there's just not much leadership and initiative being shown to uh, make that a statewide to really take responsibility for that being a statewide thing. Yeah. Now, and when you say local, it's, it, I want to make sure that people understand when you say local, it's actually a pretty good amount of distance, right? Yes. In fact, our, our commuter rail system, uh, which commuter rail isn't really the best term. Regional rail is probably a better term because we do have, have all day service rather than service that's just focused around uh, the commute, but that extends from Provo in the south all the way to to Ogden in the north, which is a different distance of over 80 miles. Yeah, that runs hourly all day and half hourly in, in the mornings and the evenings. And that really connects the, the greater Salt Lake City metro region, which, which we call the Wasatch Front, and that's a, a region of, oh, I forget because we keep growing. So I keep forgetting exactly what the numbers are, where Salt Lake City itself, uh, we are, we, we comprise a relatively small percentage of, of our metro region. We are uh, just over 200,000 residents in Salt Lake City itself. But the overall uh, metro region, which demographically comprises three MSAs uh, and, and one big CSA uh, combined statistical area, that is, is over two and a half million people now. And Salt Lake is also a, a huge destination for, for people who are visiting maybe in the summertime or the wintertime. They're heading up into the mountains. You know, if I... You know, if I fly in and, and I want to, you know, jump on the train and, and go up and down the Wasatch, that sounds like that's very much a, a doable thing. How about if I want to jump on the train and maybe go to, to Park City? Can I get on a train to do that? There, unfortunately, is not a train to Park City. That's something that a lot of us advocates are pushing for. Uh, there was a train that operated until I believe it was 1947. Okay. And as just like many metropolitan rail systems that disappeared after World War II, we there was actually no public transit at all between Salt Lake City and Park City, even though in a driving time, it's, it's about a half hour drive to go up the canyon and get there. And it wasn't until about 2013 or 2014 that the, the Utah Transit Authority, which is the, the transit district for, for the Wasatch Front and Park City Transit actually were able to get together and collaborate on a bus route that made that connection. And it interestingly was actually had previously been illegal under state law for transit districts to actually have services that went into each other's districts, which limited the, and it was, it was something that was set up so, so that it wouldn't compete against private services. But the, the issue that the, was that the only private services were basically luxury shuttles and, and limos that would pick you up at the airport in Salt Lake City and take you up to Park City. And there, as, as housing has become more, uh, more unaffordable uh, in the last decade or so, there's been a huge issue in being able to get workers from Salt Lake City up to Park City and they, they finally were able to, to collaborate on, on actually making that connection. But unfortunately, the, it's only about, the bus only runs about six round trips a day. And so it's woefully inadequate, especially 
the Interstate 80 that, that makes that connection has three lanes in each direction and is is carrying a massive amount of I, traffic. I, I, I was just going to say, and, the, and there's probably no priority transit lane for them, right? Yeah. And it usually the, the bus flows pretty good, but it's, uh, it's, it's basically rush hour service in the morning and in the evening. And so if I, let's say, want to hop on the bus and eat lunch in Park City, I have to leave downtown Salt Lake City at just after eight in the morning on the bus because the next run going up there doesn't leave until about uh, two in the afternoon. So yeah, there's there, there's a huge need to be able to go beyond the metropolitan region uh, to the rest of the state and to neighboring states. Yeah. And the, the slide that you've got there is actually taken from a presentation from the Federal Railroad Administration, which outlines the corridor identification and development program, which is one of the components included as part of the bipartisan infrastructure law, which there, there's a massive amount of funding for, for capital projects to actually implement things. But everything you see on the slide there actually just covers getting federal funding in order to do the studies necessary to implement new services. And back in December, there were, well, throughout 2023, there were more than 90 applications that were made to take advantage of corridor ID funding and there were 69 applications that were awarded a half million dollars each in order to jumpstart the planning process on these applications. And so on that map, we see a variety of the, the very light gray lines are the existing Amtrak routes, but uh, the dashed red lines are high-speed rail proposals that the planning process is, is being funded through this program, the dash blue lines are new services that non-high-speed rail services that have applied for, for funding to, to study. And the solid blue lines are existing services uh, that, where there's been applications to improve services, uh, for the most part, add more frequency. And the, the corridor ID program is kind of focused more on state-sponsored services, which are routes that typically travel less than 750 miles and that are a partnership between states and Amtrak. The map that we have on there now shows the existing Amtrak network with the state-sponsored routes in dark blue and the orangish tan routes are the existing long distance routes. We have 15 long distance routes that, that crisscross the country. And part of the bipartisan infrastructure law also required the Federal Railroad Administration to study how to expand the long distance network across the country. And the, the big thing that everybody got all excited for was this map that we see there that shows, in addition to the 15 existing routes, uh, another 15 routes crisscross in the country. And if you like bounce back and forth between those two maps, you really see that uh, we are trying to fill in a whole lot of gaps all around the country that have lacked service. And we're, we're trying to provide service to a whole lot of areas that aren't being served, but also make it a lot easier to make trips that... Uh, you could make by train, but it would require a, a transfer and a long layover and maybe even staying overnight somewhere to, to make the trip. For example, if I go from, from Salt Lake City up into Washington to visit my, my family uh, and I take Amtrak, I have to uh, do a layover either in Sacramento or in the Bay Area to do that trip. And with what's proposed in this plan, we would restore uh, routes that we lost in the past that would make that a direct trip. 
so that uh, not only adds more population to the population that's being served by Amtrak, but it's also making a whole lot more direct trips possible. If I can jump in and and say, yeah. Uh, So about a year or so ago, I was like conceiving this idea of taking the, the active towns tour out on the road, on the rails, not on the road, but on the rails. And I'm like, okay, I want to get to Denver because I always, you know, go to Boulder, Denver every summer. (laughs) <laughs> of course, if I want to do that, I either have to go all the way to California and then up and then over, or I have to go all the way to Chicago and then back over. I'm like, wow, okay. If I mean, you can totally see that if we have the proposed network, I suddenly have a much more direct you know, route that I can do. And, and literally, by the way, Mike, I don't know if I've told you this, I can walk to the Amtrak station from my yeah. house. <laughs> and so I could literally jump on my Brompton with my luggage, zip on over the Amtrak station, you know, catch the, the, you know, the Amtrak that's rolling right through Austin, which is the Texas Eagle, I believe is the name of it. Yep. And ultimately, I would want to then transfer over to whatever this red line would be called and then, you know, head up through Trinity and then boom into Denver. Once I'm in Denver, then I get on. uh, I can either ride my bike from the the Denver station, the 20 some odd miles or more likely I just get on the the Flatiron Flyer with uh, a bus, which is a nice uh, prioritized bus, although based on this diagram, I would also have the potential of a train that would take me right into Boulder and uh, take advantage of the transit station that has already been, TOD that has already been built uh, right there in Boulder. Let's make it happen. What do we, how do, <laughs> yeah. how do we make this happen? <laughs> the, the study is, has been, and, and the way that all this is, has laid, been laid out is wonderful. Uh, the the one downside is the implementation timeline where we're not uh, currently the timeline that it's on is, is basically a 15 year timeline. So we're not expected to see any new routes rolled out until 2040. And we are trying do you, to do you have hard. any idea? Do you have any idea how old I would be? <laughs> right, exactly. Well, and I'm, I'm right behind you on that too. So we are trying to to compress that timeline from 15 years to like an eight to 10 year timeline. And in fact, the the, the comment that uh, Jim Matthews keeps making, who is the president and CEO of the National Rail Passengers Association, is that we were able to put a man on a moon on the moon in less than a decade, like closer to eight years, and we should be able to figure out how to make this happen. Can I jump in and say say this? Is that you, you made the point earlier that a big portion of what this proposed network is of the preferred routes is the fact that in many of these cases, there were already previously routes in. So it's not like literally we're trying to put a man on the moon and we've never done it before. Right. In many cases, there's actually maybe even rights of way still preserved. Well, all of actually, if you go back to the, the, the map again, all of what's on the map is all existing rail corridors. It's the, the, the rail already exists. There may need to be a few, few improvements made in yeah, order. It's, to- and it's probably, and it's probably being used by, uh, yes. by freight rail. By freight. Yes. yes. And so in terms of, of building new rail lines, that's not really necessary for this plan. The, the big hindrance is actually the equipment. And the, the problem is that Amtrak's existing long distance fleet is basically as old as I am. And uh, I, I actually had my birthday yesterday. I'm, I'm 47 and- Happy birthday. <laughs> I, the, the Amtrak long distance fleet is, is about the same age and is in desperate need of being replaced. And Amtrak has just started 
the procurement process to be able to do that. But it reasonably is going to, to take uh, 10 years to replace the existing fleet. So you've got to replace the, the whole existing fleet and then build a whole new additional fleet on top of that to roll out the new services. And so that's the, the big thing that we're, we're, we're going to get a whole lot more people connected, uh, which is what these, these slides are showing, that we, there's an increase in, in the people. And especially when we start looking at area rural population throughout the country, that we're, we're getting a 51% increase in rural communities that are served. And uh, there, there's a big push as part of the bipartisan infrastructure law for this to not just be like a lot of typical transportation funding where it ends up just serving existing metropolitan areas. We, we really want this to go beyond that and, and serve uh, rural populations. And we're basically more than doubling the number of route miles in this system and also being able to serve a lot of rural areas that are in poverty and a lot of, of Native American areas that have lacked service, which uh, there, there's a big focus on economic and social well-being because a lot of places, rural areas, they're a long way sometimes even from uh, definitely from airports, but also often from from freeways. So it makes it very difficult for people to travel. And there's often not a lot of public transit that's available. So a lot of people rely on, on Amtrak trains to get them to where they need to go. And we're hoping, the, the, the big ask is that we hope that uh, everybody looks at this and says, hey, we want to make this happen, and that you reach out to the members of your congressional delegation and say that, hey, this is a priority. And uh, unfortunately, none of this is going to be high-speed rail, so it's not going to be 200-mile-an-hour trains, but uh, it's going to really catch us up on, on what we should have preserved post-World War II when a lot of these uh, services disappeared. We were just looking at that combination of the existing map, which kind of is what we've got on the screen here now, is the existing Amtrak lines, and then the proposed. And uh, But now, this is something a little bit more personal. This is your mileage. Yes, this is... Uh, since I'm a, a GIS nerd, it's very easy for me to make a map like this. And I've kept track of all of the Amtrak routes that I've ridden, and I have not been everywhere that Amtrak serves, but I've covered probably more than two thirds of the country so far. Well, and I can tell right now, I mean, I'm looking at one of those blue lines because the blue lines are one, the ones that you have not yet been yes. on. And so you haven't been down here to Austin. I have not gone any further than Fort Worth into Texas. And uh, that trip that, well, going across uh, Missouri <laughs> and then going from St. Louis down down across Arkansas and, and to Fort Worth and then going up to, to Oklahoma City, that was actually all going to seeing you in Oklahoma City two years ago. So That's right. That's right. Which yeah. I think... I think that was my first big trip after the pandemic calmed down. So if you were, if you were to, to come visit me, I would bet that it would be probably make more sense for you to head to California than down and then over. Yeah, it kind of depends. I, I would probably go go by way of California in order to cover uh, territory that I haven't covered yet. Yeah, yeah, because then you'll be able to do that whole stretch of of the of the that you haven't done yet. Yeah, which is is an interesting route because uh, it's it's called the Sunset Limited that runs between Los Angeles and New Orleans, mm -hmm. and uh, it actually gets uh, at one point within a hundred feet of the border just outside of El Paso, and really gives you some some interesting desert views. And I haven't and I haven't been on it either. And so a big part of what we want to talk about today is 
is this concept. Um, yeah. If I took the Active Towns tour out on uh, on the rails, what that would be like. And you were gracious enough to, to put together an entire folder of uh, images to help walk me through what my experience would be like <laughs> if I if I did it. So yes. you know, start starting out with uh, you know what my accommodations might be like if I decided to uh, to do this. And before we dive into these photos, uh, uh, talk a little bit about the the options available in terms of doing this type of travel. And to set this up and give you some context, I, I will be in Europe for two months this summer. And so I've purchased a, a, a year rail pass. And so I've, you know, I've gone through and, and went ahead and purchased a, a year rail pass where I have access to uh, these rail routes across 33 different countries and I can do unlimited trips, you know, in segments and unlimited uh, during that time uh, in the your rail friendly countries. It's usually I just have to I may have to set up a seat. I may have to uh, do a reservation. But in those countries, I, I won't have any additional cost. And then for some of the um, the countries that are uh, a little less friendly, like, say, France and Spain, I actually w- would have to pay a small uh, additional amount for my seat reservations, but it's still quite nominal and minimal. So that's, I'm familiar with riding the train and doing the Active Towns tour via Brompton bike and train. I've been doing that uh, since 2015, but I've never done Amtrak. So what would my options be like, you know, for, for, for Amtrak? There's a, a fairly wide stretch of, of options on board. I didn't include any pictures of, of the coach seating because that's usually something that people are very familiar with. And Amtrak, especially on the long distance trains, has uh, very super comfortable seats. The seats are more luxurious than what you actually see on first class seats on on planes. So you, you do have nice, good seats. But I recommend if you really want to do it right, you really should look at accommodations in the uh, in a sleeper car, right. which gives you options. The, the one I have usually gotten is the roomette, which is a small room with two seats that face each other. And at night, uh, that that gives you lots of room. Yeah, at night the the two bottom seats fold down to to give you the bottom berth, and then there's a top berth that that swings down for the upper. So you so you actually uh, as a, a solo traveler, you end up getting this, and you have it to yourself. Yes, and it's it's not like some other trains in the world where you may end up having a room and sharing, having to share it with a stranger. On, on Amtrak, if you get a room, it's always you and only the others in your party. Yeah, in your parties, yeah. So if you have a significant other or if you have a, a child or two, you might share the, this room at. Right. Yeah. Okay. And it's very cozy. Uh, if you, you know, if you're sharing it, you want it to be somebody who's a significant other or someone that you're, you're good friends or family with. Right, right. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a little cramped. Yeah, not, not too bad, though. It's really a, the perfect size for just one person, though. So, right. okay. um, and it, uh, there, there are shared bathrooms down the hall or down the stairs and also a, a shared shower. So you get, you get access to everything that you need. And there are also larger, more expensive rooms where you actually get your own, your own toilet and shower on sweep. It's, those are the, the price jumps up a lot for those. Uh, and there are also rooms for, for and, people. And so uh, you, you see, I'm hungry because I've I've not only fast forwarded to food, but I fast forwarded to dessert. Dessert, <laughs> yes. Uh, one of the things that's not always 
that advertise very well by Amtrak is that if you are traveling on a long distance train and you have a room, any of the rooms, all of your meals in the dining car are included in the price of your ticket, which is one of the things that like you factor into the the kind of high cost of, of getting the, the, the room accommodations. It's like you're going to eat on the train anyway, and you might as well get the good food and good service in the dining car and great views. You know, while, while you're, you know, having your steak, you can look out and watch the world go by. Uh, and they also have not, not the most widest menu. They, they don't really have the option to offer a whole lot of variety, given the fact that they're limited to what they can do on a train. But they do have things like vegetarian and vegan options also on board. But it just gives you like a whole other experience that is the almost 180 degrees opposite of what you experience flying. And it's a little bit more like a road trip, but you get to sit back and let someone else do the driving. And one of the other great things, uh, most of the, the long distance routes in the West, like that, that's actually uh, an example of the snack bar that's downstairs in the lounge car or also known as the, the observation car. Uh, or the sightseer lounge. So there's, there's an entire car that is what they call non-revenue seating. So it's got seats in it that you can't book. You just go there on a first come first serve basis when, when you get tired of sitting in your own room or in your seat. And it's got all of these huge windows that you get to sit and look out of. And it is not just a great experience in terms of being able to experience all this uh, scenery, but it's you're having this shared experience with your fellow passengers. So you're, you're basically having this, this great time and, and learning to enjoy mingling with, with other people as what is really like a third space on the train and it's it's a great place if you just want to go and socialize and strike up a random conversation because you're you're on the train for a long time so you have the opportunity to actually mingle with people in a way that you don't really see on on flights and that you can't really do to the same extent on like a road trip you know, unless unless you stop off at a diner to eat and really mingle with with people there, you don't really have that same opportunity on a road trip. Yeah, and 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 one of the one of the routes that I am familiar with, but I've never ridden on, is this one here, and this is in Glenwood Canyon, and I I've almost always been right here on that bike path. <laughs> Right underneath the I-70 is a wonderful bike path. And I've, I've ridden on that bike path many, many times and seen the train go by and thought, you know, one of these days I'm going to do that. But talk about this experience. I mean, you, you do get to really, you mentioned you're, you're, you're able to, you know, sort of mingle and be alone as much as you want, as well as with other people as much as you want. But you also have access to just stunning views. Yes. And on, on this particular trip, I, this is actually sitting in my room. I happened to be on that side of the train where I had these views of Glenwood Canyon. And uh, but, you know, if, if you happen to be seated on the wrong side of the train, you do have the option to go to the lounge car to, to look at both sides. But it's just wonderful to be able to sit back and relax and watch the world go by and be super comfortable. And I believe this was actually last spring while I was on my way to CNU in, in Charlotte. And I, I ended up being on a time crunch coming back. So I flew home, but I actually went all the way to Charlotte by train, made transfers in Chicago and New York City on my way there. How long did that take you? 
It, well, I, I, I did it. I did a same day transfer in Chicago, but I actually ended up staying two nights in New York City. Okay. So how does that work out? T- how does that work out ticket wise when you do that, when you want to do, you, are you, are you basically booking your way through to New York city? You know, you're going to get off and stay a couple days and then it's a, yeah. a whole new ticket. Yes. It, it was, it was one ticket, including both trains from Salt Lake city through Chicago to New York, and then an additional ticket from, and there are, one well, of the other warnings that I have to give is that Amtrak is often late. So when you've traveled by Amtrak a lot, you learn to avoid tight transfers. And for example, I often will make the the transfer that I did that time in Chicago to continue on to New York because the train's scheduled to arrive at 2.50 in the afternoon in Chicago and it doesn't leave to go to New York until 9.30 that night. So you have some buffer but there, there are a lot of transfers where it's it's much better just to stay an extra night on your way there, often in Chicago, in order to avoid any any big mishaps in your schedule. But uh, the photos that we're looking at right now are probably the most scenic part of the Colorado Rockies that you see, which are Byers Canyon and Gore Canyon, which are, are further east from, from Glenwood Canyon. And you are like right there looking out at the Colorado River. And this was a couple of years ago in early spring. So we see the river very much iced over in a lot of spots. And that was also a trip where there was lots of wildlife that it was just the right conditions to bring the deer and the elk out to that. And I I was able, sometimes it's really hard on a moving train to snap pictures, but I was able to to get this photo of this bull elk just strutting his stuff there. Good job, nice. You you never know what wildlife you're gonna see, but yeah, like the, these were all of the cows that that bull elk was was out there uh, trying to impress. And <laughs> I, I I think he did quite well. <laughs> yes, definitely impressed everybody on the train. Yeah, I bet. Uh, yeah. So you, 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 you mentioned, you mentioned uh, tips in terms of, you know, be, be cognizant of those transfers. So getting back to this dream that I have uh, of maybe hitting the rails here in North America, maybe trying to duplicate what I'm going to be doing for two months in Europe. I, I'm not sure if there's like a, a, is there a pass that I can buy that is similar to like a two month pass or uh, an unlimited number of rides, or do I have to buy like a specific route and then kind of do what you did and then buy, do another ticket if I'm getting off? You can do a month long pass that will give you, I forget the details, but it gives you, I think up to 10 segments. Oh, okay. I think I found, I think, I think I found it here. So yeah, it looks like it's a 10, 10 ride, uh, multi-ride pass. And then I also see that you've got the USA rail pass, but that, how does that do? That's also 10, 10 segments. Yeah. The multi-rail pass is more of a, a commuter thing. If you're traveling frequently on Amtrak over very limited. Yeah. So this is the, this is the one here. here. It's 10 segments, but the problem with that that I had with this when I was doing the research is that's coach. Yes, it only includes coach, but you can uh, use it and upgrade, pay the additional uh, cost to upgrade. It's a little bit difficult to book because to, to take the USA Rail Pass and book it for the sleeper car, you basically have to either go see a ticket agent in person, which is probably the best best way to do it if you are in a city where they've got a staff station that has uh, in-person ticket agents, or you can also call up on the phone in order to do it. But unfortunately, there's no way to just book online, which is the easiest way to, to book. Uh, the, the other thing that I recommend, too, is 
if you are going to be doing a lot of travel on Amtrak, you want to sign up for the Amtrak Guest Rewards Program, which is very much like a frequent flyer program that allows you to earn points on the travel that you do. There's also a credit card that goes along with it that you can get that will help you earn points on, on the Amtrak travel that you do, or the, the helps you earn points just on the things that you spend on the on the credit card. And I've never done the USA Rail Pass just because I am not someone that sleeps well in coach. So I I really for for me if I'm going to be taking a train and going overnight, I really want to take advantage of having my own room and getting the the meals included in the dining car and having access to the shower, especially. But there are a lot of different options that you can do if you want to do a trip around the country and do it as a tour. I would, yeah, just, I, I would be happy to, to give you travel advice if you've got cities in mind that you want to visit as part of the tour. And I can tell you which, which routes are the ones that have the, the most scenery. Scenery can be a little bit subjective too. <laughs> There's no way to objectively measure what, what the best scenery is. But usually the route that uh, packs the most punch in, in terms of scenery is the California Zephyr, which I'm slightly biased because I live on the route of the California Zephyr here in Utah. But it's the route that goes from, from uh, Chicago all the way to the Bay Area. And it, you, on that route, you basically get a whole day traveling through the Colorado Rockies and ending the day in the deserts of Utah. And then you get a half day going through the uh, Sierra Nevadas from Reno on into the Bay Area. So you, yeah, some of the other really scenery packed routes going along the coast starlight going from from los angeles all the way up to seattle that has some wonderful scenery in it too uh, the empire builder which is kind of the northernmost east west route that's got a lot of great scenery especially as it passes uh Glacier National Park, but also going through, well, it, it's one of the routes that actually, it, it splits in Spokane and half the train goes to Portland and the other half goes to Seattle. So you get the either the scenery of the, the Cascades going to Seattle or the Columbia River Gorge if you're going to Portland. Uh, uh, you Another, another very scenic stretch is actually traversed by a lot of Amtrak trains and even the Metro North commuter rail on a portion of it is going uh, between New York City and Albany because you are right along the Hudson River uh, for the majority of that ride to Albany. So that, in fact, the, the Metro North Railroad goes as far north as, as uh, Poughkeepsie and that's usually the considered the most scenic commuter rail line in the U.S. You just have to make sure that you're on the, the side of the train where you get the views of the Hudson. Right. Yeah. It seems like one of my biggest challenges are, are going to be having a, a lacking that flexibility of getting kind of exactly what I would want, which is, you know, a, a comfortable sort of place where I'm doing a longer distance route and then also being able to get off at the city that I, you know, at, at you know, let's just use the city and say um, uh, El Paso. I want to spend a couple of days in El Paso. I've, you know, but it's not super, super easy for me to do that long segment from Austin to El Paso. It's a bit too long for a coach seat. You know, you, you get what I'm going, where I'm going with this right. is, yeah. is that, you know, it's many, 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 many hours. And so you probably are like, yeah, I'd probably want to, to get, you know, one of the roomettes. And, but at the same time, I don't have necessarily the flexibility of, of being able to just get off, spend a couple days, 
or a day in, you know, meeting people, interviews, documenting things for the video, for the channel, and then jumping back on, on that same ticket, I'm having to purchase another ticket. Yeah. You have to book an individual segment for each, each one of those. Yeah. Is it that big of a deal? I mean, is it, is it going to be that much of a financial hit for me to, to, to break them up? Or when you do like the entire sunset, you know, leg, is it a much better deal? It, it, it's really not a disadvantage to, to break it up. Okay. It's the, the way that the pricing buckets are, they're very much like they are on airlines. So you're, you're very much, it, if you book early, you can get a much better deal than as, as, as the trains fill up, the prices will, will go up. So if you book early, that helps keep the costs down. Okay. You're not at a disadvantage. Like if you book from San Antonio to El Paso and then El Paso to Los Angeles, you're basically, the two segments are basically the same price as, as the one longer segment. So it's. Uh, okay. Okay. Oh, well, that's good to know. Yeah. Yeah. So in other words, you're, you're, you're advising me, don't overthink it. Yeah, Just don't over yeah. <laughs> hit the rails, have some fun, do some active town stops along the way, come see you in Salt Lake City. Yes, exactly. And uh, yeah, like book early. Sometimes if it's if it's a busy season and that de- kind of depends on individual routes, you know, sometimes it's very much in the summer when they're busy, but Sometimes people will go on on trips to do leaf peeping in in the fall, and people will will go to see the snow in the winter. So there can be busy times, and obviously holiday seasons is is also very busy. So book early. I would say you know if you want to, if you're really looking to to save money, book at least six months in advance. If you want to make sure that that you've got the seat or the room that you're looking for, I would say book at least three months in advance because sometimes things can get filled up and there just won't be any space available. Sure, sure. Yeah. And uh, also, yeah, like I mentioned before, try and delay proof your itinerary. Itinerary. So yeah. don't pack don't, it in too close. Yeah. Everybody warns people and says, yes, if your train says it's arriving in, in Chicago at two in the afternoon and you're going to attend your friend's wedding at 6 p.m., you want to come in a whole day early. <laughs> And because delays are are very common and sometimes there are, if it's something really important, sometimes there are extreme delays that that occasionally occur where a train can be delayed like 12 hours. So you want to, if you've got something really important, you want to be able to give yourself a lot of padding. And there's, like with flights, if there's something that's, catastrophic that happens, you can often rebook another itinerary at the last minute and still get there. And that's not an option because we, we don't have a whole lot of train routes operating around the country. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But we're, we're going to, but we're going yeah. to. Mike, it has been such a pleasure catching up with you, uh, folks, uh, Head on over to the, the the website here. Make a donation uh, to the uh, Utah Rail Passengers Association. Uh, give Mike some support here, and uh, I can't wait to see you once again. And I am long overdue for a visit there in Salt Lake City. The last time I was there, you took me out for a bike ride, and we saw some really cool stuff, and we shot some video. Uh, so yeah, I need to, to to come back, and now I have an incentive to. Uh, hit the rails and come visit you by train. (laughs) Thank you so, so much for joining me once again. I'd be happy to have you visit again. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up. 
leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, it'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content here on the Active Towns channel, please consider supporting my efforts by becoming an Active Towns ambassador. It's easy to do. Just navigate over to activetowns.org, click on the support button. There's several different options out there. Uh, again, thank you so much for tuning in. It really means so much to me. Uh, and until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.